Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Miles, and my channel is all about finding your passion, fulfilling your potential and achieving your goals. In this video today, I've got a very special guest. So today we are filming our Made It series where we interview successful people from different fields, different backgrounds. They tell us how they came up and hopefully it will inspire you. And I'm delighted to say my first guest is a news anchor, a social media guru, a TikTok sensation. It's Mona Kosar Abdi. Mona, thank you for joining us today. Of course, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. This is great. So I think let's get straight into it. Can you start off by telling us a bit about yourself? Yes, definitely. So I was born and raised in San Diego, California. Uh, that's where I'm from. That's where I grew up and went to college there. Um, but for the last, I would say, seven years, I've lived in five different states, just pursuing uh, my dream, my dream career, and just moving throughout the United States. So you grew up in the States. How was it like growing up there? Well, I'm biased. So I would say, especially because I grew up in California, we have the beaches, the mountains, the sun. Um, it was amazing. I did think that the rest of the United States was like that. And I quickly learned the minute I left that it's not every... Uh, aspect. I mean, you travel a lot, so you know, every different part of the United States has its own vibe, its own culture. Um, so I, I'm definitely biased and will say that I love the culture in California, but uh, I've lived in the upper Midwest. I've lived in the South. I lived in the Northeast. I mean, right now I'm currently in New York. So I would just say that it's been, it's been great. I, I mean, I love it here. <laughs> and when did you decide to become a news anchor? How did you know it was your passion? Oh, that's a good question. So I would say definitely by the time I was 16 years old, I was lucky to, enough to know early on what my passion was. Um, but I would say the first inklings were probably when I was 12 years old. I loved storytelling. I would um, take our uh, camcorder and record videos of myself. I would interview people. I would interview my stuffed animals. I mean, the whole cliche thing that people say all the time when they um, wanted to be a news reporter as a kid. Um, but I would say that I think it has a lot to do with the fact that like, you know, growing up Somali, oral storytelling is huge, right? You grow up listening to your grandmother tells you stories, your parents tell you stories and Somali parents love the news. So <laughs> grew up with the news on 24 seven. And so it was something that uh, very early on, I thought when I was 16, I remember I probably did an essay where I said that I was going to work for the BBC. Clearly, I don't work for the BBC, <laughs> uh, but it was definitely a goal of mine. And uh, we'll talk about goal setting, but I believe that it is so important to clarify very early on, at least just even if it's not early on, the minute you know what you want to do, speak it into existence and go after it. And then everything falls into place. Woo! Love that. Take notes, people. This is gold. So obviously your industry is so competitive. Tell us about that journey you took to get your first role. Oof, very competitive. I would say it's a 20, especially now with a 24 hour news cycle. Um, you just, the grind never stops, but I will say very early on, particularly because I was going for a visual medium. It's not like you just hand in your, I'm going to call it a CV. I was going to say resume, but I know <laughs> you can say that we, we understand. We understand. There you go. <laughs> you can't just hand a, a paper resume over and say like, hire me. You have to put together a tape. And so, I mean, it's not something that comes easily. You have to um, practice a lot as well, because the first time you do it, you're not going to be very good at it, right? Mm -hmm. You have to protect, perfect your voice. You have to perfect your uh, on-air presence, your storytelling skills. And so what I ended up doing was I got an internship, but it wasn't enough. Once I graduated, I was kind of throwing my hands up in the air, right? Like, what am I going to do now? Um, but again, I am a firm believer that as long as you do what you need to do, opportunity is when um, luck meets persistence or luck is when opportunity meets persistence. And so I got an opportunity to work at the local news station in my hometown. And so from there, what I would do is I would, um, before my shift, go out with a reporter, help them out, carry their stuff, do whatever they needed me to do, right. interview people for Love them. It. And then in exchange, they would give me um, like one minute to just shoot something in front of the camera so I could put it all together and send it all over. Um, I will say like the, the advice you get very early on is just send it to anyone who will watch it, right? All over the 50 states of the United States. Um, but I was actually a little bit more strategic about that. I wanted to see like, 
that the station that I was going to go to, where people go, do they grow from there? And that's how I settled in central Virginia. But again, it took a lot of hard work, a lot of persistence, uh, and a lot of taking no for not taking no for an answer and just you know, keeping at it, I would say. Amazing, I, I love it, I love it. I think that's the way to go forward. So obviously it sounds like there are so many barriers to entering and pursuing this career generally, but I don't know about the US, but in the UK, it's very rare to see a black female news reporter. Did you find that as a hindrance or did you find that your difference actually helped you pursue your career? That's a very good question as well. I would say, actually, let me just preface it with you guys are actually a lot more progressive than we are. I remember oh. in 2009, I was in London oh. and I was watching, um, I think it was Sky News and I saw a reporter with braids in her hair and I was like, yeah, no, that would never happen here. <laughs> Clearly things have since progressed, but it took about a decade, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, that just goes to show you that even... Um, as a black news reporter, like you have to have a certain aesthetic, you have to have uh, certain criteria that you jump over. And I remember when I first started, um, we would like, and it wasn't just me. So I know that I'm not crazy because it, my friends and I would do this too. You would count how many black reporters were at a station already. Cause you know that they weren't going to hire more than maybe a handful, or if they had two, then wow. you might want to set your uh, sights on another news station because of the fact that uh, it was limited. The station that I was at in San Diego had no black news reporters, mm -hmm. right? Because they felt like the population in San Diego weren't, wasn't um, enough to justify having a black reporter. And so there were certain areas that were more susceptible. So there were friends that would tell me their agent would say, hey, you might want to look in North Carolina, right? Where they're more open to uh, a black reporter because they have a huge black population mm -hmm. instead of maybe your hometown of Seattle or San Diego. And so I knew that very early on. The only thing I would say, the one thing that really helped me is, again, I go back to like being Somali, you're, you're an anomaly wherever you go, right? And so- <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. So you're so used to being the only one wherever you go or like breaking barriers or, you know, not seeing yourself um, in certain places that I almost had this kind of, um, naivety to me. Like I was a little bit naive and also just maybe wasn't privy to a lot of stuff that were, was mm -hmm. going on race wise. And so I just kind of like went for everything. Right. I didn't see myself as a black reporter. I didn't see myself as a small reporter. I saw myself as a reporter who just wanted an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't say I didn't experience microaggressions or any kind of um, racial bias, but I didn't pick up on it. Right. Cause mm -hmm. I was so blinded by the fact that I just wanted this one goal. I just went after it. Um, and so in the end, it kind of helped me, I will say also being different, having a different name, uh, having a different look, I would say, un unfortunately, I would say, unfortunately, sometimes that does give you an advantage over, mm -hmm. um, certain people. But uh, again, it, you also have to be very careful about getting, um, we call it tokenized, being the token, right? Yeah, or being yeah. uh, typecasted. But I would say very early on, I was a little oblivious to a lot of the stuff that was going on. I just kind of went for things. I, I love that. So a clear vision, the goals, the determination and making your difference a superpower is what helped. That's brilliant, so inspiring. And you mentioned obviously being a Somali news reporter and in the UK, I think we've had one reggae Oma big up Hey. Reggae, I'm a big <laughs> brother. In the US, are you the first Somali news reporter? No. So actually, this is very interesting. A girlfriend of mine, Naima Abdullahi, shout out to her too. She shout was in, we came up together and this is a beautiful story. I mean, she was in North Carolina at the time. I was breaking in and we are the same age. We graduated the same year. So we were like on the same journey and I reached out to her and she always talks about that. She's like, you slid into my DMs. I'm like, I sure did. Because <laughs> when you see somebody named Noreen Abdullahi, you're going to jump at that opportunity. And so we just formed a friendship until this day. She's one of my closest friends and we talk all the time. But I will say, I think it's just us two. Now there's a lot more um, younger reporters that are coming out that are um, in, in smaller markets that maybe I, I just don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say at that particular time, that is what uh, brought us close together. That is what bonded us. And to this day, we've like formed a lifelong friendship because of it. Amazing. And you, you kind of touched on goal setting earlier, but was there anything else alongside that that helped you stay persistent? And can you just tell us a bit about how you set goals for success? Oof. Okay. So 
I'm very goal driven, right? Um, growing up being first generation immigrant household, like they drill that into you, right? You're going to get the best grades. You're going to be the best. And so that I carried that mentality with me, which is nobody's better than you, right? They just work harder than you. Granted, there's some people that have an advantage, a leg up, you, but you can only deal with the cards that you're dealt. And so for me, it was all about, I won't let anybody tell me no. And I won't tell myself no, right? I'm going to, I deserve everything. And if I want something, I'm going to look at whoever's at the top. And it's not that they're better than me. They just worked really hard. So I'm going to ask the questions of how did they get there? Right. I'm going to focus on what was the path they took. And so what really helped me very early on is that I set goals. Right. Um, I said that I wanted to be a network reporter by the time I was 30. Mm -hmm. Um, and before I even knew what that really meant, I just said that this is what I want to do. I put an age now, granted, I don't suggest putting age limits on it because sometimes, you know, your journey is your journey and you have to enjoy the journey. And that's hindsight is 2020 for me is looking back. I would say, um, not necessarily putting age limit, but just speaking it into existence, right. Before I even knew how to do it, before I knew what I wanted to do, I just said, I'm going to be a network correspondent by the time I'm 30. I put my head down. I worked really hard. There were days where I would pull my hair out and say, I don't see this happening. Right. Mm -hmm. The the cards are not, the the stars are not lining up. It's not working out for me. I don't know what I need to do, but all the time a door would open, a door would open. Some opportunity would come out of nowhere. Right. And I would be prepared for it because all I was doing is putting my head down and working really hard for it. And I was able to do it by the time I was 27 years old. Never, ever did I even manage to do it. Like, I didn't expect to do it three years earlier. And also I, that when that opportunity did present itself, I wasn't even looking for it. I had other plans. I said, you know, I have until I'm 30, right? So in two years, I'm going to do this. And then maybe that last year I'll do this. And it's like, now I've been, um, a network correspondent and anchor, which I wasn't even expecting to be an anchor, um, for the last two years and I turn 30 next month. So amazing. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Was there a defining moment that helped accelerate you to where you are now? Oh, yes. So when I got my first job in Lynchburg, Virginia, let me explain Lynchburg, Virginia. It was a smaller town. I grew up in San Diego, California. Obviously, it has like 8 million people. It's a huge city. It's one, I think, the sixth largest city in the United States. Um, It's also coastal. There's just all these differences. I moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, very small Bible Belt, very Southern, complete, like everything was so different. And I signed a three-year contract, right? So I wasn't going anywhere. And um, there were times where, I mean, I was homesick, right? I didn't have my family. My family was a five-hour plane ride on the other side of the country. And it was just, I, I, I would go back to that point of knowing that I had nothing to go back to. Can I, could I have left? And, you know, my mom would have opened the door and I would have, yeah, but I burned that bridge, right? I said, there's no going back. And so I think that is a defining moment to me where like, uh, I had no retreat. I burned the bridge. So that means the only way I can go is forward. And I remember at the end of that three years, one of my, um, one of the senior anchors came up to me and he's like, what did you do? Did you get a coach? Did like, did someone train you? Like there was just a big dramatic difference. And it's like, cause sometimes you work, work, work. And it's not like all of a sudden you're going to, see the change right at the three month mark. No, you wake up one day and you go, Oh, I'm very different. Right. Like I sound different. I'm presenting different. Like my skills are improving. And so, um, I would say that was also a defining moment where, you know, people started asking like, did I get a coach? Did did someone train me? And I realized, no, it's just all the hard work. It was accumulation of hard work and it finally uh, presented itself. Love, love that. Love that. Um, and obviously you're very much in the public eye. So I guess you're kind of like a local or a national celebrity. I'm going to say global because (laughs) I'm sure every Somali person on the globe knows who you are. How have you found being in the public eye? Um, So the great part is it's I'm in the public eye for what I do and not who I am. Right. So there's not really much interest in my personal life. It's exact. It's my job, uh, which is how I like it, because I feel like, you know, when you're given such a platform, Um, you want to be able to elevate the communities that you come from, right? Give them a voice, give them a background. And there's been situations today um, where, you know, I've been able to be a voice for a community that I represent in a room full of people that don't necessarily understand the struggles that we have to, right? So um, one of the biggest things that shocked me in news was there's no 
checks and balances almost like from Mm -hmm. when someone says they're going to cover a story to when it goes on uh, this major platform. Right. It, and so if someone doesn't have a seat at the table, if they're like a community doesn't have a seat at the table and their stories are not going to get covered or they're not going to get covered how they should be covered. And so if I, for example, which w- what happened today was a little hesitant about how something, the, the narrative that we were setting, and it was going to be potentially damaging to a community, I get to speak up and say something. But then I think all the time, and especially when I get frustrated, um, why I can't give up is because if I'm not there to stop it or to voice my concerns, it is going to go on air. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go into the households of uh, millions of people. And so I would say um, that to me is something that really um, is rewarding. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant to to hear. And then have you had any really big career highlights or one big highlight that you'd like to, to share with us? Ooh, so many. Um, so I was a, uh, white house correspondent for a while and I was able to, I was working in Washington and I was working in the white house and covering the white house, Capitol Hill, Washington politics. And that is something that I would cherish for a really long time because it was during the Trump administration. And there were so many, uh, historical stories that we were able to cover things that people who have been uh, on this beat for a decade plus, or, you know, even two decades have not been able to cover because there was so much news coming out of Washington at that particular time. And it just so happened that I was there. And so I was able to cover um, not one, but two impeachment trials, (laughs) which has never (laughs) happened in the history of this country. And so um, just being on the front lines of that, I remember one a uh, particular live shot that stood out to me was um, a live shot that I did for New Zealand, right? There was like a New Zealand morning show and they were like, tell us what's going on in the United States, trying to get rid of their, uh, their commander in chief. And you're like, oh my God, this is really happening right now, right? Like the world is watching and we're able to, um, to, you know, present the facts and give you the inside scoop of what's happening. And so I would say that uh, is a career highlight for me. Amazing. That must have been so surreal. And we can't not talk about you interviewing Donald Trump. How was that? So the particular interview you're talking about was when he was running um, for obviously president of the United States on, during the 2016 campaign. He was running against Hillary Clinton. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, he was in that particular area that I was in, Central Virginia, regularly. Uh, because he has a very strong base there. Uh, there's the largest Christian university there. And um, the the president of that university is a big fan of his, had him come and speak. He was trying to get the evangelical vote. Um, and so he was coming to that area a lot. And actually really quickly want to touch on how I was able to get that opportunity because it wasn't mine. Somebody else was on that assignment, right? But this is uh, a, a testament to if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready um, because... I really wanted that story. And I was really bummed that I wasn't able to uh, cover it, which was his rally when he was coming in. It was a very private fundraiser. And the girl who was supposed to cover it at the last minute bailed. Something happened, right? And already since I voiced that I wanted to do it, they were like, all right, tomorrow morning, you're going to go cover. Here are your credentials. And so I got that opportunity. They didn't know at the time that I was going to be able to get a one on one interview with him, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But again, when you stay ready. You don't have to get ready. I was, I was ready for it. I had my questions prepared. And so when the opportunity presented itself and uh, we were able to interview him, uh, I'm not going to lie. I was a little hesitant. I, I, I heard his um, rhetoric on the campaign trail. Uh, I heard what he had to say a lot about, about a lot of the communities that I represent and uh, that I'm a part of. And um, I, you know, still pr- approached it as a journalist who was just trying to get questions for, uh, our viewers. And he was very receptive. I would say, uh, you know, I've asked him questions several times after since particularly once he was in office and I was covering the white house. Uh, but that particular interview, he was very, uh, very, how do I explain this? Very demure. Wasn't, uh, as, um, rambunctious as he was on the campaign trail. And that stood out to a lot of people that he was just uh, very soft-spoken when he was answering my questions. Mm-hmm. 
Some big words there. Ch he was chilled, basically. He was, he was chilled. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, I gotta watch my words. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that 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 makes sense, and and I agree. I, I've watched that obviously. Um, and who or what would you say inspires you? Mm, that is a very good question. Um, so early on, I would say obviously the journalist that I grew up watching, right? Um, Anderson Cooper was a big one in our household. Um, and, uh, of course you can't, uh, mention this without talking about Oprah Winfrey, right? Uh, there are a lot of journalists that, uh, have inspired me along the way. Peter Jennings was another one that, um, was a longtime ABC evening news anchor who my parents, uh, watched every night, right. To the point where, when he was, uh, diagnosed with cancer, I remember how heartbroken they were. They still, to this day, talk about um, his legacy, his passing. That's how much he meant to them. He was in her, their households every day. Um, but I would say now it's more so the people that I interview, right? The people who are uh, on the front lines, who are running grassroots campaigns, who have these remarkable stories. You realize that, you know, we, we focus so much in our society on um, celebrity culture, right? And people who are iconic, uh, people who are uh, innovators, Steve Jobs, right? The next big genius. But everyday people have some of the best stories and finding those stories and being able to present it and realize that we are all special. We all have our own stories. We all have our own struggles, but some of those struggles are universal and we can all learn from each other. We can all um, empathize with one another and show compassion. That to me inspires me. Amazing, amazing. And what advice would you give to any aspiring news reporters that want to get in the field, but they don't know where to start? Ooh, no one's smarter than you. No one's smarter than you. Uh, I believe it was Michelle Obama who, during her Becoming documentary who basically said, you know, I've sat at uh, tables with, you know, world leaders uh, dignitaries, princes, kings, and I'm here to tell you no one's smarter than you. And I truly internalize that. And I truly believe that because sometimes you're sitting, um, at a table with people who are legends and people who have been doing this for decades. And you realize that, um, no one's smarter than you. They just either, you know, have honed in on their craft. They work really hard. They make sure that they're an expert in what they do and that they put 100% passion behind what they do. Um, but we are all worthy, right? We all have the skills necessary. We all have, um, you know, sometimes we doubt ourselves. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I feel like I don't have the skills or we have the imposter syndrome, right? I don't belong here. Um, but we all belong here. And the only thing that you can control is how passionate you are, how hard you work. Um, but don't ever doubt yourself. Amazing. Don't doubt yourself control your destiny to shape your future for success. I love it. I love it. So Mona, what's, what's next for you? Are we going to see a talk show? Are you going to host the next Harry and Meghan interview? What, what, what's in the pipeline? Hey, okay. So if Corona and 2020 has taught me anything, it is, I don't plan that far in advance. <laughs> <laughs> One day at a time, right? Uh, I would say, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm very blessed right now, right? I'm doing something that I didn't even uh, think I would be able to do at this particular time, uh, way ahead of schedule. And so I would say, I, my, my boss asked me the other day, he was like, what's the dream? And I'm like, I'm living the dream, right? So I get to do what I love, uh, work for a network that um, I feel values me and provides me those opportunities. And so what's next is just doing this and just continuing to elevate. I'll say, and taking opportunities as they come. Amazing. Love it, love it, love it. And Mona, that's, that's it. That's it. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. For all the people watching, how can they connect with you? How can they find out more and follow your journey? Okay, so I'm a hot mess on Twitter. If y'all want to follow, it's at Mona K. Abdi. Um, I always say it's like my little diary. I'll give you a little tidbits, but I'll also give you the news and what's happening on our show every morning. Uh, if you have Hulu and ABC News Live, you can catch our show in the morning. And uh, on Instagram, my handle's the same, Mona K. Abdi. Thank you so much, Mona. It's been a great to have you. If you guys enjoy, please like, comment below if you want to see more videos like this and if you haven't already subscribe because i've got lots more content to come 
So thanks again, Mona, and thanks for watching. Thank you.